Previously on Drake Paragon. We family cruised in Long Island Sound, I fell in love with the romance of it. By a Hobie 16, we bought a 27 foot Stiletto 30. We bought the 40 foot Newark. I said, we definitely need a bigger boat. We raced this boat really hard. She just got faster and faster. Nobody from any other country had ever won it. It was just all very, very thrilling. We've got a lot of space around the deck, outside of the cabin, outside of the cockpit. We had these nets specifically built, and they're very tight, they're very firm, hmm. and we store our dinghy out here when we're underway, hmm. and my kayak, I bring that along so whenever I find a surfing opportunity, I can uh, go kayak surfing. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and that it's so small, it looks like you can just easily grab it and throw it in the water and yep. be underway yes. in seconds. Slide off the deck, it's great fun. And this is my daughter's favorite spot to sleep. Right here, oh, to sleep. Whenever it's possible for her to sleep outside on these, wow. on these nets. And she's been like that ever since she was a, just a tiny little girl. Wow. So they're pretty comfortable to sleep in. The Amas have two hatches and they're exclusively used for storage. Showing things like fenders and lines, and spare water, spare diesel. We have three spinnakers. Three spinnakers. Throw them down there. That's your sail locker as well. Right. Sails, lines. Yep. That's a huge amount of storage with these side hulls, Amas. Yeah. Huh. It works pretty well. As with all multi-hulls, I try and keep it light. Yep. I try to minimize, I keep purging these. These halls, it's easier to accumulate junk. So Kenny and I are always just sort of pulling stuff out, disposing of anything that, or giving away anything that we have yep. no use for. It takes yep. up space and weight. I like keeping it light. We wow. have learned in our last passage from Newfoundland up to here to keep our storm jib strapped on the foredeck in case we need it. Oh, yeah. I've found out if you fail to anticipate how brutal the storm is going to be, mm -hmm. the gale, if you're a little bit too late, you don't really want to spend a lot of time up here. No. You know, of course, we're tied into the boat, but the boat is just launching off of a wave, getting airborne. You want to spend as little amount of time up here as possible. So on this type of sailing, we keep the storm jib readily available. Wow. How does that attach to a head stay? Is it on the staysail stay? Yes, it's made by my friend in Florida, Gerard, and his company ATN. It just sort of hanks around the roller furler, huh. and you hoist it with the spinnaker halyard, and you just trim it like any other head sail. It doesn't go into the furler track? No, then. it wraps around it. Wow, ATN storm sail, ready to go on the foredeck. I think that the fellow, he's a genius. He comes up with just great spinnaker socks, and he's done a lot of single hand sailing and racing. I think he still holds the 40 foot transatlantic record of 14 days. So he personally has used this equipment, has invented this equipment, and you know, it's always really great equipment simple, it's effective. We have a, a pole up there, bowsprit, so it just expands the size of the spinnakers that we can fly. I see. All of our spinnakers are uh, asymmetrical. Yep. So we fly them because this boat never really wants to go dead downwind. She can, mm -hmm. but then we'll only go the speed of the wind. If the wind is blowing six knots, we'll go six, six knots. knots. Huh. But if we're reaching, that's what a, mono, a multi hull wants to do, especially this boat. If we're reaching off, we, we can go two and a half times the speed. Wow, it's all about the apparent wind. Correct. Just kind of keep building the apparent. 
building the force vectors, uh, flowing over the, the foils, the sails, and you can just go faster and faster and faster. All our spinnakers are asymmetrical. We fly them pretty much like just big, giant jets. We don't yeah. have a spinnaker pole. This yeah. bow sprit suffices for that. So when we jive, going downwind, we'll just jive it like we would any heads. Hmm. Do you use that in strong wind as well, or is it just lighter well, there, air? There are three sizes. My favorite size is it's more of a like a screecher than a spinnaker. Depending upon our point of sail, we could probably use that up until about maybe 17 knots air. Mm -hmm. They're more for lighter winds. Mm -hmm. like when we were coming down here, when we lost the diesel, we flew the spinnaker most of the way. Mm -hmm. And we had very, very light winds. We saw three knots of wind most of the day. Hmm. And we were getting up to five knots of speed, mm -hmm. eight knots of speed. Five knots of speed, mm -hmm. eight knots of speed. Wow, three knots of wind. Yeah. <laughs> it was fun. It was a beautiful sail because of that. Wow. The anchor. Oh yeah, it's a plow. It's a plow. It seems like plows work really well on this boat. We've got two up there and we've got a spare and one of the Amas. They seem to work really, really well. Have you ever dragged anchor? I've only dragged anchor maybe twice. On avalanche. Life. Yeah, I'm a pretty conservative <laughs> anchor guy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Put out a lot more scope than probably most people. And I set the anchor a certain way every time. I make sure that it's really in there. If, if I don't, I can't sleep. can't get a good rest if, if I'm worried about the anchor. What's your process for anchoring? Of course, come up into the wind. We'll find the most suitable depth. And up here in Greenland, it's difficult because mm. as you know, on these fjords, the, the, the sides of the fjords are very steep and the water is deep. I mean, you can go right up to the edge of the fjord and it could be several hundred feet deep. Mm -hmm. So the trick is to figure out where there's a bottom that we can reach. And we'll look for rivers that are coming in that are constantly depositing sand and silt and that sort of thing. Or sometimes on the chart they indicate where someone else has anchored in the past. There's a little anchor on there and we'll try that out. But we'll come up to, we'll come up into the wind and figure out exactly where we want to put the anchor down. We need a fair amount of swing room in this boat because yeah. of the size of a tennis court. And we'll drop the anchor and then just ease back on it and let the plow dig into whatever it can find. And when we see that it's holding a very light pressure, mm -hmm. then we'll just throw in some reverse, throw more and more and more RPMs mm -hmm. into the diesel in reverse until the thing is just sunk into mud or sand or whatever it can. And then I feel comfortable. I hate dragging. Two yeah. times I've done it. It was an awful experience. Was that on Avalanche? Uh, one was in an island in the Caribbean on Avalanche, and the bottom in this harbor was just scraped out by the current. So it was hard pan bottom with a little bit of silt over it. So you wouldn't know that the anchoring was really bad. Mm -hmm. The only thing that gave us a clue that the anchoring was bad was all the wreck boats around the perimeter of the harbor. Wow. So after we dragged there in the middle of the night, I realized where all those wreck boats came from, how they got wrecked. God. So that was that was pretty unnerving. You know, the trades blew right through there and the current just ripped right through the, this harbor. And so there's a lot of forces on, on, on the anchor. We eventually put out three anchors. Wow. One gigantic Danforth I borrowed from a local guy there, a really nice guy. <laughs> Biggest Danforth I've ever seen in my life. Huh. It's like it came off a battleship. Mm -hmm. And that was the only thing that held us. And once in my 40-foot race boat, my kids, we were in Cuddy Hunt, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and the holding there is uh, historically bad. That's why they have so many moorings there, I guess. We dragged there, and nothing really happened, but it's just a terrible feeling. It's like you're out of control. Thank goodness you were aboard in both yeah. cases. Right. So the head sails we've got set up uh, mm -hmm. with roller furlers. Pro furls. Uh, yeah. This is the stay sail. That's at Genoa. This once again allows me to unfurl and furl all from the cockpit. How high is the mast? The top of the mast stands 65 and a half feet above the surface of the water. So, as you know, the bridges in the intercoastal waterway, mm -hmm. which we went through on our, from Florida on the way up to here, 
stand at 65 feet at best. So we couldn't get a lot of mileage in the intercoastal waterway. We tried a couple days when the weather was just obscene. But when you come to a bridge, we'd have to stop and let the tide go out and get underneath the bridge. Wow. Try and time it just right. There's a couple times we got held up and we had to anchor on the side of the intercoastal waterway. And <laughs> wait for low tide. Wait for the tide to go out, yeah. So it's really not an intercoastal waterway boat. No. So wide as well yeah. as some places in the ICW. It gets a little thin passage and we've got two big boats passing port to port. Right. The thing that saves us is that each arm, as you can see, there's a heater on the surface of the water. Yep. We have nothing hanging down underneath them, like a skeg or, or a rudder or anything like that. And the main hull, with the centerboard down, it's a swing keel. We draw nine feet. With it up, we draw five feet. Mm -hmm. So the lowest point is the rudder. And that we can also, I'll give you a tour of the transom, the rudder will swing up. And so then the lowest thing we have is the belly of the boat, yep. which is about three feet. So if need be, we can get into some pretty shallow Three places. Three so feet if you need. It's a great boat for places like the Bahamas. Is the draft of the Amas much less than the main belly? Yeah, they draw maybe an inch. An inch! <laughs> <laughs> of course, when they're the lured hull, they'll drop down a foot or two if you press them hard. But, you know, just at anchor here, they're just teetering. The bottoms are just teetering on the surface of the water. So we can move over, like in the intercoastal, and get out of the way of uh, boats coming in the other direction. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the ditch is pretty narrow and the channel is pretty narrow, so the Amas will be skimming over a foot or two of water, but that's okay. Well, they can get closer to shore and right. shallower depth. Right. Huh. Typically, any boats coming in the other direction, we scare. Yeah, and they see us. <laughs> what is that coming down <laughs> my way? They slow down and, <sighs> you know. A lot of people give us as much room as possible, fortunately. <laughs> and your anchor chain lockers here, I see you've got the electric windlass for up and down. and We do. You know, a lot of cruisers, and I would guess you're probably this way, you have all chain. Mm -hmm. We have 50 feet of chain, hmm. and then another 200, 250 feet of, of anchor line. Hmm. So total road of about a little over 300 feet. I suppose not having all chain keeps some weight out. Correct. That's my debate all the time is whether I want to have that security of all chain like you have, which makes a, mo a more bomb-proof anchor system. Mm -hmm. Or do I want to load up with that much weight, especially up front? I mean, the, the worst place, I think all boats are like this, but most of for sure, the worst place to load up weight is on either end, either the, oh, the yeah. bow or the stern. It's better to load it up in the middle if you have to. So that's the debate I always play out in my mind. That's the pump out, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's the pump out yep. there. And you've got a tent on your port side well, here. <laughs> my, my crew for this leg, both professional sailors, they're instructors with outward bound sailing instructors. They just feel more comfortable being outside in their backpacking tent. Wow. So, which is funny. I mean, I really like it. When <laughs> I sail when my kids were little. That's pretty much what I would do with them too. I would stick them outside in the tent. Really? They all, with the dog and they thought that was fun. <laughs> so it's kind of makes me feel good. See a tent on the deck once again. <laughs> Your shrouds come back to the mast rather than being attached to the hull. So you can walk around here and not trip. Yeah. And is that the reason that they're, they're my only reason. coming to the mast? I believe this rig is quite conservative for this boat. My last two racing boats was a 30-foot stiletto catamaran, and then I had a 40-foot Newick trimaran. I had wing masts on them. Wing masts? Yeah. Wow. And they could rotate carbon fiber wing mast. So instead of suffering any drag at all, which a mast like this would do, yep. it's all lift. Now you rotate it so everything off the deck, the, the sails and the mast, it's just all lift. And I really enjoyed that. But this boat came with this fixed mast. Yep. And I think it's more conservative and, you know, I keep telling myself every day, we're not racing, we're not racing. <laughs> and <laughs> even though I trim our sails, and try to keep the boat going as fast as possible, particularly, you know, the old adage that, what do you call two boats sailing in the same direction? 
It's a race. Race. <laughs> I love running oh. down other boats. Oh God, and, you'll uh, never, you'll never get that yeah. out. <laughs> you'll always I'll be always a be racer. Yeah, I have to keep telling myself that uh, we're cruisers. We're yeah. not racers. Yeah. And I had to sort of reorient my expectations in, in terms of miles mm -hmm. per day. We can easily do 250 miles a day. Because our diesel will push us at nine knots. So if we have any wind at all, I mean, yep. that's a pretty easy target to hit. And so when I was first planning our first leg from San Francisco through the canal up to Cape Canaveral, I was thinking in the way I used to think with the same racer mentality. For decades, when I sailed, I was either racing the boat, going as fast as we could, or I was delivering the boat to the start to a race, and of course I'd have my kids on board mm -hmm. um, with a limited amount of time, or if I'm bringing the boat you know, back and forth from the Caribbean, because we'd usually race the southern circuit in the winters, I have a week vacation from work, and that's all the time we had. So I didn't worry about weather, I didn't even concentrate on weather that much. We just left, I only have a week, mm -hmm. <laughs> I gotta get home. And so I always thought in terms of being in a rush, climbing on the boat and, and getting going fast and keeping the boat running as fast as possible while we're offshore. And after a while, you know, Kenny, my good buddy Kenny, kept reminding me, you know, John, we're not racers. We're not racers. We can stop in this port and we can relax and we can enjoy ourselves. And so it's, you know, it's, it's taken me probably 8,000 miles to understand that. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> My instinct is to set the sails, put up as much horsepower as possible and go. Yeah. So I'm fighting those urges. You've always been a racing sailor. You know, I started racing as a little kid at my dad's yacht club. I wasn't very good. My sister was the one that was the real rock star. And I sailed and sort of dropped out of sailing for about 10 years, which a lot of kids do, like when they're in high school and, and in college. And then after college, the bug just hit me again. But it hit me via multi-hulls. So I loved the speed. And then I thought I was getting pretty good at it. And my natural response to my personality, I always say, well, let's race. And <laughs> so I raced pretty hard for about 15 years. Uh, did a lot of offshore, single-handed and double-handed stuff. Raced against the French, the Germans, the Dutch, the Swedes, and it was great fun. Wow. It was really, really exciting stuff. What's that flag? That's... Flag of the great state of Colorado. Oh wow! <laughs> U.S. vessel and Colorado vessel. <laughs> so when we, we show up in a port, everyone tries to figure out what that flag is. Yeah. We come up with Cuba, <laughs> Colombia, some country with a C. Wow. And I go, no, it's from the great state of Colorado. Colorado. And, okay, so that's kind of odd to fly an American flag and a Colorado flag, a mm. state flag. Mm. The point. Mm -hmm. is so just as yourself when you and I met is for people to start asking me questions like that and you know I can meet great people and become friends with people and that just is a is a conversation starter I just think it's kind of funny a, a sailing boat from the state of landlocked state like Colorado yeah. people always their first comment is well those first few thousand miles were pretty rough <laughs> I mean, <know>, wow <laughs> So there's your jury rig with the outboard engine from the dinghy. That's right. Wow. The diesel failed. We were trying to figure out how we were going to get out of this anchorage. And so we jury rigged this thing here where we could mount the, the outboard engine off the transom of the boat. We set up this, this little tiller. <laughs> and Jannie, she's really familiar with small outboard motor uh -huh. operation and, and repair, actually. And so she was our operating engineer back here. <laughs> and I was at the helm, and she and I would talk to each other. And we never did open up full throttle, this engine, because I thought with all this weight, it's not designed to push 17,000 pounds. We kept it at, at pretty low RPMs, but we got up to about three knots. That's a six horsepower. Wow. Worked great. It worked. It got you out of the anchorage and back out into open water. Yeah. Yep. And it got you into this harbor. We were meeting our fourth 
crew member. He was here and, and while he was waiting for us, he networked around the harbor and he found this place here that will repair boats and stuff and they agreed to take a look at our diesel problem. So he organized actually this big landing craft to meet us at the beginning of the harbor. Uh -huh. And I'd never been here before. I didn't know what conditions we're going to face. Mm -hmm. So I agreed. I said, yeah, let's send the landing craft out and, and tow us in. Wow. I wonder how old that thing is and what its history is. Well, I tell you, when I first saw it coming out, I experienced a few moments of fear. Yeah. Thinking, whew, I think that's more than we bargained for. For a tow. Huh. But the captain of this, this boat was extremely skillful. Gosh, he was just terrific. There were, there were really no issues at all. It's a little embarrassing to be pulled in by a powerboat, but hey. Hey. I've <laughs> embarrassed a lot in my life, so. <laughs> so then you've got a Garmin radar and an Eryx marine wind generator. Mm -hmm. And is this antenna for single sideband or VHF? Yep. It is. You don't have an insulated backstay for a single sideband. No, we have a masthead yeah. antenna up there. Two. For VHF, yeah. And a Windex. We have three ways of generating electricity, charging our batteries on this boat. One is this wind generator, mm -hmm. which I think is just terrific. When you I did the transatlantic race, and there was these two guys, inventor types, that were manufacturing this wind generator. Uh -huh. And the name of the company then was Southwest Wind Power. Southwest Wind Power. So they got a hold of me and they said, look, we've got a prototype. We're not in production yet. Would wow. you take the prototype across the Atlantic? And I said, sure. Okay. So we left our motor on the dock in England and we hooked this up and it worked just beautifully. We won the race and so they got a lot of good promotion out of it and they developed the company as as far as they wanted to, mm -hmm. and then they sold it and retired. So I feel as though we, we have just something, to, a tiny little bit to, to do with their success, wow. however tiny. So when it came time to put another generator on there, I just felt obliged I should buy their wind generator. Aye. It works just great. And then we have solar collectors. I'll be better in southern latitudes, mm -hmm. but they work in, you know, trickle charges, mm -hmm. slow charge. The wind generator will charge the batteries pretty quickly if you have a decent wind. And these look maybe about an amp and a half. And then we have a high output alternator. So when we run the diesel, that'll charge up the batteries quickly. Is that a spare rudder? It is. So if you lose your main rudder somehow, then you can just take that and put it into those pentels. And then you've got sand steered from back here. We've got some extenders on that too. So the helmsman can stand here. Mm -hmm. and, and watch where he's going and sail the boat. And then we tried this out down in Belize during the first leg just to see how it would work and it works. It does work. You can yeah. sail. You can sail. <laughs> it's not as good as you know, the original equipment, rudder, but it does work. And, and I thought about since then how to set this up and I would probably attach some lines to it mm -hmm. and maybe run them out there with some snatch blocks yeah to bring them back into the cockpit yep so i could wrap around the winches and i could i i could move the boat and still be in the cockpit presumably one of the conditions that i would be in if i wrecked the rudder if the rudder broke would be bad weather and it would be a perfectly good time not to be out here yeah, <laughs> yeah standing on the transom trying to drive the boat if you could bring those lines to the winches and you could also lock the rudder in a position for hoving to or... Exactly. Yeah. When we did hove to this boat, and that storm on our way up here, she liked the rudder being free. Hmm. I tied it off, tied it to leeward, tied it to windward, tied hmm. it to center. She didn't like that. She hmm. liked me to leave her alone. <laughs> When you were hove to? When we were hove to. With the rudder just free. Right. Huh. And uh, consequently, we even hove to, we were still doing about five knots in the right direction. And it felt very controllable and safe. I felt like just all the descriptions I have read about from other folks who had to hove to. Mm -hmm. And um, so she just liked to be on her own. Amazing. Interesting. And we kept a watch out here. Somebody just sat there, but it was comfortable and it was relatively dry and we felt pretty safe. How long were you hove to for that time? Yeah, that first storm was probably 20 hours. Well, the second storm, 
equivalent strength over 50 mile an hour winds. We tried a different strategy. We set up the storm jib and a triple reef main, and that probably lasted about something close to that, maybe 17 hours. We had a rest of about 10 hours between these two storms. And she handled that really well too. She, we had speed on, and during those 17 hours, it's only a guess, but I, have, I bet we averaged 16, 17 knots with just a small amount of sail up. But she liked that, you know, she's a boat designed to, to move. And I think she's most comfortable that way. And in heavy, heavy air, she wants to move. I've never deployed the sea anchor. We have one. Where do you store it? Uh, right underneath the cockpit oh, seat. Right down the, right on the part side yeah. cockpit So all I have seat. to do is drag it out here, these, these uh, horizontal chain plates, they're mm -hmm. designed to receive the sea anchor. Huh. Um, huh. But being a racer, I've, I've never deployed that. Although I've known some friend, friends, Walter Green being one, and a few other famous multi-L folks who actually won a race because they set out the sea anchor where all the other racers went backwards, they stayed still. Oh, they didn't this, lose ground. This one huh. story, uh, Walter Green, great guy from Maine. I think he went from fourth place to first place while he put out the sea anchor. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, so it was very shrewd, very smart. Wow, interesting. So once again, I hope that I never have to see those conditions where I need it. Yeah. Spend all your time preparing for it and hope never to see it. Yes. Next on Drake Paragon.